Welcome to Component 7, Working with Health IT Systems, Unit 11, Health IT in the Future. The objectives for Health IT in the Future are speculate on the relationship between HIT and health reform, suggest alternative designs for usable and supportive HIT, hypothesize how HIT might intersect with publicly available data to improve health, that is, point of sale, weather, GIS, foods, etc., and predict avenues of future, future innovations in HIT. Many would probably agree that our healthcare system is in trouble and must be fixed. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Office of the Actuary, states, quote, healthcare costs have been rising for several years. Expenditures in the United States on healthcare surpassed $2.3 trillion in 2008, more than three times the $714 billion spent in 1990, and over eight times the $253 billion spent in 1980. Stemming this growth has become a major policy priority as the government, employers, and consumers increasingly struggle to keep up with health care costs, end quote. The continual struggle to keep up with the cost of health care services is unsustainable, particularly in light of a global recession. To add insult to injury, even though we as a nation spent these huge sums of money on health care, the U.S. is still a poor performer when compared to other developed nations around the globe. The Commonwealth Fund ranked the United States last in the quality of health care among similar countries and notes that U.S. health care costs are far above other developed nations. According to Rohr in a, in a June 2008 article from the British Medical Journal, quote, health care in the U.S. ranks lowest among developed countries, end quote. How can this be? How did we get to this point, and how can we reverse the trend? Movements are underway to try to address the issues that plague the U.S. health care system. Of particular note is the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010, also called the Accountable Care Act, or ACA, which was signed into law in early 2010. The ACA has catalyzed efforts to radically transform the current way that, health, that care is provided and reimbursed. Think about how health IT can help us to win this war. What have you learned so far about the capabilities of health IT that can help us to provide higher quality and more effective health and healthcare services? How might the ACA help us to achieve these lofty goals? One ACA aspect that calls upon health IT is, quote, the Center for Innovations at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS. This center has a $10 billion budget to identify and test promising new models for delivering and paying for health care. Dr. Don Berwick, former director of CMS, says that patients, quote, need, quote, journeys of care, not fragments of care, end quote. So one of the ambitions of this test bed is to figure out what it would take to remove the fragmentation and make the journey smooth and safe for all of us. It does not take a rocket scientist to figure out what we cannot that we cannot reduce fragmentation and smooth care journeys without a way to facilitate information exchange. Have you personally been on a healthcare journey where everything is smooth and worry-free? If so, congratulations, and you may be one of a select few who can say that. Conversely, how many times have you, as a parent, as a child, or in your own personal life, had to run around gathering health data on your own? How many uh-ohs have you said or heard in relation to a healthcare experience? How many near misses or almost errors have you witnessed in healthcare? Fragments and fracture, fractures pervade our healthcare system. These troubles are ones Dr. Patricia Abbott experienced firsthand when her father struggled with an illness, she said. Quote, before my father passed away, he was seeing four different doctors and none of them knew what the other was doing, ordering, or planning. At the time of my father's death from an undetected drug toxicity induced respiratory failure, he had spent four weeks in two different medical intensive care units, developed ventilated, ventilator acquired pneumonia and three pressure ulcers, contract, contracted a central line bloodstream infection, and had a fall in the hospital. On his admission to the last medical intensive care unit, the chief resident took me aside presented me with a collection of paper records jammed in a chart that was at least 12 inches thick and said, 
quote, can you just tell me what all this says? I will spend hours trying to figure out your dad's story by trying to wander through all of this, end quote. For the privilege of this disjointed and heartbreaking adventure, Medicare and Medicaid got to pay close to one half of a million U.S. dollars. My beloved father, a victim of fragments and failures, never made it out of the hospital. It has been two years now, and I am still haunted by the system failures and that 12-inch stack of jumbled paper medical records. We can do better. We must do better. End quote. One of the major direction-changing goals of the ACA-driven Center for Innovation is to figure out how to test and then take new models of care into practice. It requires investigation of how to unlock and exchange precious yet siloed data and remove the fragmentation and disconnections that are hallmarks of healthcare in the U.S. The Accountable Care Act, Section 3501, Part 933, also calls for the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or AHRQ, Center for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety, to, quote, identify, develop, disseminate, and provide training in healthcare quality, safety, and value, and to, quote, provide for the funding of those activities of organizations with recognized expertise and excellence in improving the care of healthcare services, including children's healthcare, by involving multiple disciplines, managers of healthcare entities, broad development and training, patients, caregivers and families, and frontline healthcare workers, including activities for the examination of strategies to share best quality improvement practices and to promote excellence in the delivery of healthcare service. End quote. Finally, the practice of telehealth is expected to expand significantly as a result of the health reform bill's emphasis on increased access and cost savings. CMS is examining the process and issuing proposed rules to streamline the credentialing process for telemedicine providers at distant hospitals and safety net clinics. This area of U.S. health care reform is seen as a way to increase access to care and ameliorate the impact of provider shortages, particularly for those in rural communities. It's pretty obvious we need to change our course in health care. Health IT will play an increasingly significant role as we change directions, but it requires providers who are competent in the use of health IT and a workforce that can support HIT-enabled care. The website on the slide is a federal government site that is very helpful and may help you to deepen your understanding of the relationship between reform and health IT. If you let your creative juices flow and begin to think about how health IT can be designed in alternative ways, the second objective for this unit, and predict future avenues for innovation in health IT, the last objective, it can become both a fun and scary exercise. As you embark upon a new career in health IT, you will have users approach you with a variety of ideas of how to make something better, be it the layout of a screen or a new technology that can be used to support smarter, easier, and safer healthcare. Many of those ideas will never come to fruition, thankfully so, as some may be downright bizarre, but the point is that an important characteristic of someone in in the health IT field is to be open-minded, have superior listening skills, and to embrace change. As we have discussed in prior units, change is not easy, but in health IT, change is part of the job, It is also important that you help others to embrace change and think creatively about new ways of doing things. That requires that you actually hear and comprehend what your users are telling you, and you must be an educator. So listen to what your users are saying, assume the role of a teacher, and provide the pros and the cons to a suggested approach, and help them to better understand. Remember, a rising tide lifts all boats. On the slide are some of the alternative designs for health IT that are floating around when this presentation was created. Wearable computers, like the watch type device pictured here, is reflective of the efforts of designers that are trying to develop computing technology that works for a variety of different users. Other examples of wearable computers include sensors being woven into clothing, similar to NASA technology that astronauts have worn for some time, which can allow unobtrusive monitoring of changing physiological parameters such as temperature, pulse, glucose levels, etc. Think about alternative uses of this wearable technology. Perhaps it can help the elderly to stay longer in their homes by allowing caregivers to track activities and monitor safety, similar to the old commercials of, I've fallen and I can't get up. 
Moving away from wearable computers and into architecturally embedded monitoring technologies, sometimes referred to as smart homes, can we help older patients to stay in the home longer by monitoring things like the stove has being left on? Alterations in wake walking patterns, tracking if the refrigerator is being opened and closed as a proxy for eating behaviors. And if an early stage dementia patient has started wandering outside of the home. Of course, the other side of the coin here is that many people have serious concerns about invasion of privacy, something that we must never forget. This sort of monitoring would require informed consent by the patient or the user. At the same time, maybe an elderly patient person might consider this to be a reasonable trade-off for being able to continue to live independently for a longer period of time. It's difficult to predict what sort of trade-offs might emerge as health IT continues to evolve. Continuing in this vein, another quite controversial modality is the use of implantable chips. Many people have their pets chipped with a sensor that is about the size of a grain of rice, and there is an FDA-approved device on the market called VeraChip that is being used in humans. There are pros and cons, of course. Chipped Alzheimer's patients who slipped out undetected become lost can be readily identified and returned. The chip mobile has been spotted in many elderly communities in Florida. There are upticks in its use in Japan in kidnap prevention strategies. Others may say that having an implanted chip with an encrypted ID that links to your secure online medical record may save your life if you collapse in the street and require emergency medical care. On the other hand, there are religious and cultural issues to be considered, privacy and security concerns, and other factors that seem to invoke the creepiness factor in many. Mobile solutions for mobile clinicians is a very important area where health IT innovation is needed. Initially, back in the day, clinicians were happy to get a computer in the nurse's station for ready access to online resources. Quickly, the need far outstripped the availability of a, work, of a workstation in the nurse's station. Numerous machines were needed, and inevitably the queue at shift change and before and after rounding was nightmarish. Soon, computing technology moved into the room as a permanent placement but the budget required for one machine, one patient, and the crowding of patient rooms shifted procurement for an, in another direction. Computers on wheels, or cows, sometimes called wows or workstations on wheels so you can't be accused of pushing a cow around, became the rage because mobile computers seemed the right thing to do. Unfortunately, the issues of pushing 60-pound computers around Dealing with disinfection, since computers can become vectors for transmitting bacteria from hands to keyboard, then into another room and then onto another patient, and the challenge of charging the batteries has contributed to standard design cows edging toward becoming a dying breed. Smartphone and tablet apps for health are expanding by leaps and bounds. Perhaps the more interesting development is not so much in the apps, but in the growth of the concept of an iPhone or iPad-like architecture for housing the apps. Could we not have a health IT architecture that allows such creativity to bloom and then run on an open platform? There are already thousands of iPhone apps out there, but they only run on iPhones. We need an open app architecture. Taking the iPhone health app's idea on an open platform and combining it with smartphones, not just cell phones, seems to be a very promising area for health I future health IT development. Finally, robots. Many healthcare institutions already have robots that deliver meal trays and supplies, fill pharmacy orders, and so on. However, there is a growth in using robots similar to the one pictured here to actually visit with a patient. This is not to imply that a robot can replace human contact, and it's important to note that robot does not mean some scary sci-fi pile of metal. Bots can be great ways to connect folks with one another, allow a visiting nurse to visit without being there, allow a faraway specialist to see a patient right in his home, etc. Bots can distribute medications, take vital signs, educate, and so on. A visiting nurse can visit every day instead of twice a week because of the loss of the need of, to travel and saving in time. Anyway, there are many areas where health IT can grow. A few other areas of innovative health IT, at least at the time that this lecture was produced, are reflected here. On the top left of the slide, you will see an image of a device called LookTel. 
Supported with federal grants from the National Eye Institute and NIH, this device was built to combine the power and convenience of smartphone technology with innovative artificial vision software. The device promises to be extremely useful for the blind or vision impaired. The LookTel device can be used to automatically scan and recognize objects such as money, packaged goods, CDs, DVDs, medication bottles, as well as buildings or landmarks. There are also interesting videos available on YouTube regarding LookTel that you may be interested in. Again, consider the impact that this device, Turn Toward Health, could do. Read medicine bottles, turn in a product label into an audio so a visually challenged person could determine the salt content of foodstuffs, or to distinguish between a can of cat food and a can of tuna. This is more fodder for your con creative consideration. In the top right of the screen is a contact lens with an embedded sensor from Sensimed. Such devices can be used to track eye conditions such as intraocular pressure in glaucoma patients. Google recently announced a patent for a contact lens that can track blood sugar levels. The image of the iPhone reflecting into the hand is a particularly interesting concept. Think about mobile clinicians and ways that an EHR can travel with them th via their smartphones. This is a tricky design proposition. A mobile device needs to be small enough to travel with a mobile clinician, but big enough to be usable. Today's smartphones have not solved this challenge yet. The problem with using a smartphone to access and review an EHR is in the real estate. In other words, the screen is very small and it makes it extremely difficult, or impossible, for a provider to view all of the data needed to support high quality decision making. Ergo, the iPhone projection device. The view afforded to the user is no longer constrained to the smartphone screen. The user could project the EHR onto the wall, therefore decreasing the problem of that tiny real estate. We have a small mobile device that can now make the data contained within viewable. Stop here and think for a moment, however, have we solved one problem and created another? If you display a patient's chart on your hand or on a wall, what about privacy safeguards? Everyone in the viewing area can now see the patient's medical record, which is in violation of confidentiality and privacy. The point here is that for all health IT practitioners to consider is that fixing one thing can often have downstream effects, and those downstream effects can sometimes cause major issues and major safety and security concerns. But the massive, massive growth in digital connectivity, particularly in the baby boomer population, seems like a tremendous area for innovative health IT. What are some of these intersections where publicly available data may be of use for public health? Many of you have probably heard the term biosurveillance. Many of us became familiar with this term in relation to the fear of terrorist attacks. Fleischauer, Diaz, and Sosin in 2008 defined biosurveillance as a, quote, collection and integration of timely health-related information for public health action achieved through the early detection, characterization, and situation awareness of exposures and acute human health events of public health significance, end quote. There are many different dimensions of biosurveillance, however, and while the goal is not to do a deep dive into this topic area, it is beneficial for you to think about how large sets of data can be used for health purposes. Aside from biosurveillance efforts, most in healthcare are busy trying to get at the data that is generated as a natural product of healthcare services, particularly in relation to obtaining the data necessary to achieve our quality measures bank benchmarks. Remember, Data is not like wine, it does not get better with age. So there is quite an effort underway not only to get the data into health IT systems, but to get it back out, to make sense of it, and then to use what we discover to improve health and health care. As we are digging for those nuggets of information, it's important to note that there are valuable indicators that are hiding in plain sight. Let's think about purchasing patterns in a Walmart. When sales of cough medicine or Imodium go through the roof at the local Walmart, chances are that there's an illness running across the community. When school absenteeism skyrockets, it's a pretty good indicator of some sort of community illness. Digging a bit deeper, often spikes in school ab absenteeism has a direct correlation with increased adult work absenteeism. Par parents are either sick as well or are forced to stay home with ill children. The point is that some of these types of patterns and seeming unrelated data can be related to changes in community health. 
Thinking back to those Walmart buying patterns, there is an actual term for this. Eisenbach coined the term infodemiology in 2009. Dr. Eisenbach's rationale for investigating this area is summed up like this, quote, The Internet has made measurable what was previously immeasurable, the distribution of health information in a population, tracking in real time, health information trends over time, and identifying gaps between information supply and demand, end quote. Here is Eisenbach's formal definition of infodemiology. It is, quote, the science of distribution and determinants of information in an electronic medium, specifically the Internet, or in a population, with the ultimate aim to inform public health and public policy. Let's see infodemiology in action. Google flu trends was a really interesting example. Here's a paragraph from Google.org that explained how it worked. Quote, each week, millions of users around the world search for health information online. As you might expect, there are more flu-related searches during flu season, more allergy-related searches during allergy season, and more sunburn-related searches during the summer. You can explore all of these phenomena using Google Insights for search. But can search query trends provide the basis for an accurate, reliable model of real-world phenomena? We have found a close relationship between how many people search for flu-related topics and how many people actually have flu symptoms. Of course, not every person who searches for flu is actually sick, but a pattern emerges when all the flu-related search queries are added together. We compared our query counts with traditional flu surveillance systems and found that many search queries tend to be popular exactly when flu season is happening. By counting how often we see these search queries, we can estimate how much flu is circulating in different countries and regions around the world. Our results have been published in the, nature, in the journal Nature. End quote. However, according to David Laser and Ryan Kennedy writing for Wired.com, Google flu trends, quote, failed spectacularly, missing at the peak of the 2013 flu season by 140%, end quote. Google eventually shut down the program. But this does not mean that this work is not valuable. In fact, the main point here is that as more and more data becomes available, there are huge needs for and value in pattern detection work. What sorts of health behaviors cluster together? Is there a link that may not be as obvious that we can explore to improve health delivery? Here is an example, and it has absolutely nothing to do with healthcare, but it does illustrate the concept. You've probably heard the word data mining, and in essence, this is really what it is, but here's an example as one of those classic, quote, market basket analyses. As you listen to the story, think about how this could be applied in regards to health. Even though it is called market basket analysis, think about health, not selling shoes. Market basket analysis is really just another way to refer to what people buy and the patterns that may exist between buying one product and buying another product. An example may be in a convenience store. Maybe the owner wants to study what customers are buying so he can arrange products that are more likely to be bought if they're in close proximity to one another. Have you been to the grocery store and seen the placement of tomatoes, basil, and mozzarella cheese all together? This is not a coincidence. Think about those candy displays in the grocery market. Is it a coincidence that they are located at eye level for the child in the shopping cart while the, while the parent is maximally stressed, unloading groceries, looking for keys, and trying to find the credit card? Have you ever thought about why all those junky sweetened cereals are located where they are on shelves in the stores? They're certainly not located at the top of the shelves. They're placed right at kid eye level. It's about product placement to maximize sales. Anyway, back to the market basket analysis. A convenience store manager wanted to see what people bought together. He studied the results of months of sale data from his barcode scanning database. So many things that clustered were obvious. People would buy bread and milk. People would buy soda and a hot dog, or soda and a sandwich, or a hot dog and chips, or whatever. That's pretty obvious. Understandable. But then this manager chanced upon another interesting find, which was the clustering of the purchase of beer with diapers. And this was quite unexpected. The manager found by conducting focus groups that the reason that these two elements clustered together in buying patterns was that ma mom had sent dad to the store to get diapers for the baby and dad could not pass by the beer display without picking some up. 
Think about this from a business perspective. If you have diapers on sale and you find a strong relationship between the purchase of diapers and more conventionally, let's say, baby food, and you place them together in the display, but you don't put them on, on both on sale at the same time. So in regards to health, could we turn this around and say what tests cluster that may just be an ordering habit and not evidence-based? What health services do patients use or inquire about when they're visiting at a health facility or for something else? What sort of trade-offs are better for a diabetic who's craving a sweet? And if you put your mind to it, you may think of a creative way to think about infodemiology, HIT, and better health and better health care. This concludes Health IT in the Future. In summary, we can look back at the objectives and think about the journey that you have just taken. We talked about the relationship between HIT and health reform with discussion about the ACA, which was signed into law in 2010. To reach the goal to achieve more responsible, effective, and safe care, we must increase the adoption of health IT, a major driver within the ACA. The Center for Innovations at the CMS came into being due to the ACA as we discussed in this unit. This center is expected to identify and test promising new models for delivering and paying for health care with a heavy reliance on innovate, innovative health IT. Recall also that the HRQ Center for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety is also deeply tied to the ACA, with the goal of identifying, developing, and disseminating knowledge in healthcare quality, safety, and value to a plethora of diverse stakeholders. Hopefully you also remember the statement by Dr. Don Berwick about journeys of care, not fragments of care, and understand why we must begin to think about ways to stitch those fragments into a concerted whole. We launched into the second objective for Unit 11 regarding alternative designs for usable and supportive, supportive HIT where the pleas for open-mindedness and good listening skills were made. There are new inventions every moment, and there will continue to be. Examples such as increasingly smaller and smarter phones, wearable technology, embedded monitoring, health apps, and so on were pre briefly mentioned. Even as we rush headlong into HIT-enabled care, the point was made that we must continuously and rigorously weigh the costs and benefits, particularly the trade-offs and threats to privacy and security that may accompany innovation. We have addressed the impact of reforming our health IT system and how health IT can be utilized. The future of HIT was suggested in a series of images and challenges to a new way of thinking about health IT design and doing. Yes, some may be out there, and maybe by the time you're watching this presentation, it will be old hat. No worries, this is a mind expansion exercise, and it's only constrained by your level of creativity and out-of-the-box thinking. We talked briefly about alternative designs and explored a bit in regards to using digital data from many different sources, both inside and outside of healthcare, to improve health. We hope you've enjoyed this unit and are looking forward to the future to see the emergence of health, new health IT to help us on our journey to better, safer, and more effective health.